Hey guys, Bartell's Bookshelf here with a uh, semi-early birthday book haul. Um, so Nakia at Plot Twist, um, our friend Laura and I, well, me and Nakia, we uh, we share the same birthday month. We're, we're both March birthday people. Um, and so uh, since we've been friends, we've been kind of uh, consolidating our birthday celebrations together and uh, doing stuff uh, as a group. Um, last year, we went to uh, Powell's Books in Portland. Portland, Oregon, and um, this year we decided to go to uh, San Francisco and look at a few bookstores, um, which I will uh, I'll show you in a minute. Um, I got a little bit of footage of some of the the stores. Um, we didn't end up getting a ton of things because a lot of the stuff there was more expensive than we thought it would be. Um, in fact, we were so kind of like disappointed by our pitiful haul that um, we went to a couple other places that I've already shown in previous videos. We went to uh, Borderlands Books and Dog Eared Books where I got a few more things. So I'm going to show all of that in this video, as well as um, some uh, some books that came in recently from thrift books and things like that, just to kind of get a full <laughs> birthday book haul thing going here. Um, but yeah, so um, here's uh, here's the footage from that, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into the book haul. We went to um, San Francisco on Saturday. We had to get up really, really early because uh, Laura and Nakia had uh, tickets to go to the uh, the San Francisco Zoo that morning. I didn't want to go, so I just stayed in the hotel room. Uh, I stayed at the Holiday Inn, or we stayed at the Holiday Inn, I should say. Um, it was a pretty nice hotel room. Here's a, here's a, here's a shot of it. Um, you know, nice soft beds and everything, uh, and a really nice view, as you can see, out the, uh, out the window here. Um, nice, uh, busy thoroughfare, lots of buildings, nice, pretty view. Uh, I had um, that that evening. I had a, a, a burger from the hotel for uh, for for dinner, and uh, and then the next morning we uh, we went on our uh, book touring extravaganza. The first place we went was to Russian Hill Bookstore on Polk Street. Um, it was a pretty cool store, as you can see from the uh, interior here. Uh, lots and lots of books. Um, pretty nice uh, layout. Um, not as uh, cheap as we were hoping, but we found some interesting things. Here's the horror section, which, as usual for a lot of bookstores, was pretty pitiful. It was just these three shelves mixed in with manga and some other stuff, graphic novels and things. And a lot of it was stuff that I'd either already owned or it was being sold for new prices, so I didn't grab anything from there. Um, this was also really, really interesting. Uh, a bunch of old uh, pulp paperbacks, including Daw books and some old uh, Ace Doubles, but again, they were being sold for collectible prices. There wasn't anything below $7, so I didn't end up coming away with anything. And then the second store we went to was this one, uh, Green Apple Books on Clement Street. Uh, this was a pretty cool store as well, um, much bigger than the other one. Um, I only got a few shots of the interior here. This is only the first floor. There were multiple, multiple floors, tons of different sections. Um, unfortunately, everything was pretty expensive, so we didn't end up with too much. But there were some interesting places, uh, or interesting sections in the store, like this one, which was all um, New York Review of Books uh, publications, um, who put out um, sort of, you know, cult classics and underappreciated works of literature, that kind of thing. Unfortunately, these were all being sold for new prices, so no used stuff, so I didn't end up buying anything from here, but still, it was really, really cool to see that. As well as this um, interesting piece of art, uh, yeah, so, you know, if you want to learn how to do any of that stuff, uh, this is your section. And before we left, there was uh, this guy in the parking lot where we were. Uh, seems like he's a really, really big, or he, I don't know, could be a girl or whatever. I'm I don't mean to assume their gender, but uh, seems like they're really into um, Cthulhu. Uh, they're obviously a fucking nerd. You can see the, the Cthulhu stuff there. Rullier, uh, Miskatonic University, Cthulhu, Eldritch Life, Nyarlahotep. So yeah, whoever, whoever, whoever this car belongs to, uh, they're a big fucking dork, but that's cool. Okay, so, uh, um, so the first thing I have here, this is, uh, Fingers by William Sleater. Um, I had read one of William Sleater's books before, um, what was it, House of Stairs, which is this really weird, almost like psychological horror kind of thing about these kids, like, trapped in this, like, House of Stairs, um, and apparently William Sleater was a, a, a sort of middle grade YA-ish um, author in the 70s who was kind of known for that sort of stuff. Um, this one sounds really, really weird. Um, 
It's about a, a kid. Na- yeah, uh, uh, all his life, Sam has been jealous of his younger brother Humphrey, the famous wonder child of the piano. But now at fifteen, Humphrey is a teenage flop. So his parents come up with an incredible plan to boost his fa- failing career. First, they force Sam to write some new piano music. Then, at the top of the music sheets, they sign the name of a long-dead composer. Then they trick Humphrey into thinking that he wrote the music in a trance, that it came to him from beyond the grave. Humphrey and his new music are a sensation, and the money starts rolling in fast, but Sam feels guilty and suddenly afraid. There are bizarre signs that maybe some ghostly force has touched his brother's fingers, and now it's threatening Sam's very being. So yeah, that sounds really cool. That actually sounds really similar to um, the Goosebumps book, um, Piano Lessons Can Be Murder, but this was published in... 1983, so, yeah, I don't know, that could be interesting, it was cheap, it was like $3, I got this from Borderlands Books, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't know, I just love weird, creepy, YA, horror stuff like that, and I enjoyed, um, ha, uh, I enjoyed, um, House of Stairs, so hopefully this is good too, I mean, even the cover art looks really similar, but, yeah, so, that should be interesting. Okay, these, these, uh, next few I got from, um, Green Apple Books, um, this is, uh, Fear of Flying by Erica Zhang. Jong, 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 I don't know. Um, but this was uh, originally published in 1973. This is a very influential um, feminist novel. Um, it caused quite a controversy at the time for being very um, sexually frank, uh, especially in regards to, you know, female sexuality and stuff like that. Um, it's a classic sort of, of of like feminist literature that I've heard a lot about but never read before. And this was cheap. It was like $4. So I was like, you know what? Why not? I've never read it. Uh, I, I, I always, I always try to at least um, make a point to to try out I- uh, influential, historically, culturally important things. So um, yeah, this is that. Uh, next we have uh, Lion's Blood by Stephen Barnes. I mentioned Stephen Barnes in my previous book haul video. He's a, a an African American um, uh, science fiction slash fantasy slash horror author. Um, he's uh, married to uh, Tanana Reeve Dew. Um, very um, interesting, influential author. Always been wanting to read more of his stuff. Um, and uh, I was just sold by, uh, about this one just based on the concept. It's a, um, it's a, um, an alternative history novel where um, the South, uh, the the old South, is ruled by Africans instead of um, Americans. Um, as it says here, uh, in ancient times, Carthage, Carthage destroyed Rome. Europe remained tribal, and the New World was colonized by Islam. Now in 1863, bordered by fierce Azteca to the south and the red men's nations of the west, Bilalistan is a vast rich land of mosques, crawls, and Moorish castles. So that just sounds really cool. Um, I love sort of alternate alternative history stuff. Um, I, I love things that sort of... Um, flip the script a little bit, you know, or it's like, it's, you know, in this case, it's, it's Africans ruling instead of whites. Um, so yeah, I'm sure, um, oh, and there's, I didn't even notice there's a blurb back here from uh, Octavia Butler. So yeah, I don't know. Hopefully that's good. We'll see. Next I have The Half-Drowned King by Linnea Hartz, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. So this is a, uh, sort of a historical adventure about, um, a, uh, a, 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 a Nordic uh, king who is um, betrayed um, and has to get revenge on the people who uh, who betrayed him. Um, kind of a basic plot, but um, it's it's sort of a historical Viking story. Um, it's it, it sounded really interesting. Um, there's like stuff about like arranged marriages in there. Um, looks like maybe there might be some like strong female characters. We'll see. Um, I don't know. It just sounded really interesting, and if I like it, I think there's a. I think this is a. Um, a series. Yeah, it mentions a sequel on the back here, The Sea Queen. So, um, I don't know. I just really liked the title. I love that cover art. Um, I love the the Viking setting, um, the revenge concept. It sounds really cool. And it was $2, so, you know, why not? Um, so, yeah, hopefully that's good. Next, I have uh, Agent Running in the Field by John le Carré. I believe this was uh, John le Carré's final um, novel that was published while he was alive. Um, it's about uh, Nat, a 47-year-old veteran of Britain's Secret Intelligence Service, is not only a spy, he is a passionate badminton player. His regular Monday evening opponent is half his age, the introspective and solitary Ed. Ed hates Brexit, hates Trump, and hates his job at a soulless media agency. And it is Ed, of all unlikely people, who will take Nat and his team down the path of political anger that will ensnare them all. So it sounds very timely, very topical. 
Uh, I remember when this was when this came out, it got a lot of really good reviews. And uh, I love John Le Carre. I've read a few of his novels now. Not not all of them, but I've read a good chunk. I loved um, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold and The Looking Glass War. Um, so... Um, this sort of I thought this I thought this would be sort of a nice um, send off you know for for the great man and his great works so we'll see how that is. Next I have Shapeshifters by Stefan Spiut. Spiut. Um, this is a Swedish novel um, translated by Susan Beard, and uh, this is sort of a big epic sort of horror fantasy tome, um, a little under six hundred pages uh, about sort of. Um, missing children um um and people and people claimed apparently that these this epidemic of missing children was caused by uh giants and trolls um so it's about um a a, a woman uh sort of uh, exploring the um the reality of these uh disappearances and finding out that there's um more truth to the myth than they realize um it just sounds really cool i've i've never read a horror novel based around um, Scandinavian mythology. So that just sounded really interesting. I mean, the shapeshifters, I, I thought it was going to be about werewolves or something, of course, but it's it's about trolls and giants and stuff kidnapping children. So it's this sort of like, I don't know, that just sounded really interesting to me. I've never heard of anything like that before, um, except for maybe Troll Hunter, I guess. Um, but this seems to have like a similar vibe to that. There's some blurbs on here from Carl Uwe Nausgaard, who's a famous, uh, another famous Swedish writer. Don't know. Seems interesting. And, I, and I've been wanting to read more um, translated novels. So, um, yeah, translated uh, genre fiction especially. So this should be interesting. Next I have Unlondon by China Mieville, Unlondon. Um, China Mieville is, of course, a very famous um, weird fiction author, British, um, has uh, written a ton of like very strange, very interesting novels, including um, Perdido Street Station, uh, King Rat, um, Iron Council, a few others. Um, I've, I've only read a little bit of his stuff. I've, I, I started Perdido Street Station a long time ago and never finished it, but I really liked it. His style is very weird, very imaginative, very British, and I love all that stuff. Um, and this is about sort of a, uh, as a lot of these sort of um, types of books are, this is about a, an alternate London called Unlondon. Um, London through the looking glass, an urban wonderland of strange delights where words are alive, a jungle lurks behind the door of an ordinary house, carnivorous giraffes stalk the streets, and a dark cloud dreams of burning the world. So I, I love that sort of shit. As I've mentioned, you know, it's, it's sort of weird fiction, fantastical, alternate London, um, surreal stuff happening. I, I mean, I love that sort of thing. And apparently this is also illustrated by China Mieville, which is interesting. I didn't know he did um, art, but <laughs> you can see some of that there. Check that out. Double-decker bus <laughs> with, like, frog legs. So, yeah, I, 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 really, I really look forward to this. Um, hopefully it's good. I, lo I love imaginative fantasy literature. So, yeah, we'll see. A uh, little bit of a more of a serious one. Um, I've mentioned before, so this is um, The New Jim Crow. Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. This is the 10th anniversary edition. So, um, as I've mentioned before in some of my previous videos, I've been trying to sort of be more more aware of things, socially aware, politically aware, whatever. I, I mean, I don't want to get political on here, although I guess, you know, every, everything's political, isn't it? Whatever. But um, this is a very uh, famous... Um, well-regarded book about, um, as it says, mass incarceration, um, and uh, it goes into how um, basically um, inc the, the the way that the prison system works in in, our, in this country is tantamount to a new version of Jim Crow, a new version of slavery. Um, so um, it's supposed to be very sobering, very devastating, very illuminating. Um, I'm hoping I'll come away with... Um, a lot of uh, interesting and sobering things to think about. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't have much to say. I, I. I don't really feel comfortable getting super, super political on here. But this is a very well-regarded book. I've been wanting to read it for ages. Um, and see, so yeah, I. I just. I just want to be more. More aware. So I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how that is. <laughs> Um, this was uh, the only book I bought that was new because I really wanted it and I was going to buy it anyway, um, and it was there. So, but this is um, Devil House by John Darnielle. 
John, Dar- John Darnielle is the author of uh, Wolf and White Van and Universal Harvester. Um, I read Wolf and White Van in 2015, and I loved it. I thought that was an amazing book. Um, one of my favorite books, actually. I, I've been meaning to buy a copy, uh, uh, buy my own copy of it for ages, but I, I haven't yet. Um, Universal Harvester, I didn't like as much. It was a little bit, huh? <laughs> uh, left me a little bit sort of um, confused and left wanting, but... This one sounds really cool. Um, it's sort of a John Darnielle's uh, th- uh, uh, attempt at like a haunted house story. Um, yeah. Gage Chandler is descended from kings. That's what his mother always told him when he was a child. Years later, he's a true crime writer with one grisly success and a movie adaptation to his name, along with a series of subsequent less notable efforts. But now he's being offered the chance for the big break, to move into the house where a pair of briefly notorious murders occurred, apparently the work of disaffected teens during the satanic panic of the 1980s. So, obviously some shit goes down. Everyone who knows me knows I I love haunted house stories. I love stuff about sort of like uh, devil worship or like uh, satanic panic type stuff. Um, Sounds really interesting. Um, Very dark, potentially. Um... I don't know. We'll see. I I I I've, I know I didn't enjoy um, Universal Harvester as much as Wolf and White Van, but I know John Darnielle's a good writer, so I really look forward to to seeing how this turns out. Uh, this was the only book that I ended up getting from um, uh, Dog Eared Books because again, a lot of the stuff that was it was either new, uh, and the stuff that was used was um, wasn't being sold for under like ten bucks most of the time. But I couldn't pass this up. This is The Prisoner, a novel by Thomas M. Dish. So obviously this is a, uh, a, a, a um, adaptation of the famous uh, 60s British TV show. A little bit sci-fi, a little bit surrealism, a little bit spy fiction. Um, it's it's a great show. I, I, I haven't finished it yet, but I've watched a good chunk of it, and I really, really like it. Pat, Patrick McGowan is awesome as number six. Um, it's got a really creepy, um, surreal, um, almost uncanny vibe to it that, that's really enjoyable. Um, and I had no idea there was even a novelization of it, but yeah, apparently this is, a this is sort of a, uh, semi-sequel to the TV series, um, that was published in 1969, and it was written by, uh, Thomas M. Dish, who's a really famous, um, sci-fi writer. He wrote, um, probably most famous for, uh, The Brave Little Toaster, but he wrote a lot of other things, a lot of horror novels, um, a lot of, like, sort of dark, uh, apocalyptic science fiction stuff, so... Uh, I, I had no idea he wrote a tie-in novel for The Prisoner. Uh, he, he, was an, he was an interesting guy. He was an openly gay man um, who uh, w- dealt with a lot of mental issues, and unfortunately he took his own life in 2008. But he was a fascinating person, um, very cynical, very very hard-edged, very, very, a very good fit for this kind of story. So uh, he's an interesting writer, and I love this series. So I'm hoping that the book is, uh, is just as good or at least interesting. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how that is. <clears throat> So uh, these next few are from Borderlands books. Uh, I won't spend too long on them, or at least too long on these first two, because um, I've talked about this author endlessly, and I really should actually read his fucking stuff. Um, But this is uh, The Paths of the Dead and uh, The Lord of Castle Black by Stephen Brust. This is uh, book book one and two of The Viscount of Adrilanka, which are, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is part of the series that adapts... um, Alexandre Dumas' uh, D'Artagnan romances. These are obviously uh, adapted from... um, What's that book called? It's the it's the it's the last the last one that's like really long and it's usually split into three parts. The most famous of which is um, Man in the Iron Mask, which I think there is a third one of this, but I don't have it yet. Um, but eventually, I'm probably going to have this whole series, so I should probably actually read Stephen Brust at some point. But again, my worry was um, if I want to read, should I read? Uh, the D'Artagnan romances first and then read these. I don't know. Like I, I, I feel weird about that. Like I feel like I'd be able to appreciate so the, sort of the references more if I understood where they were coming from. But anyway, so yeah, just I already had a, a bunch of these books as I showed off in my previous video. So I was like, screw it, why not? They're here. I might as well just take the plunge. They're cheap. Let's let's do it. So hopefully those are good. Hopefully all of his stuff is good. I'm sure it will be, but I just have to actually sit down and read it, which is the problem. <laughs> and then I grabbed uh, this. This is The Space Merchants by Frederick Pohl and C.M. Kornbluth, both uh, very famous, very influential sci-fi writers. Um, And this is a very famous uh, sort of satirical sci-fi novel that I've been wanting to read for a really long time. Um, And I really like this... um 
this version of it. It looks like an old, uh, like a, like a newspaper, like a newspaper ad or something. So this is, as I said, this is a very famous uh, sci-fi novel published in yeah, 1952 or 1953 um, about uh, Mitch Courtenay, a man of no small importance in the Madison Avenue pecking order. His latest assignment, create an advertising campaign that will sell the American people on emigrating to Venus. So it's about sort of the struggles of that, of doing that, of, 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 of being a space merchant. So um, from what I've heard about this, it's very satirical. It goes a lot into sort of consumerism and things like that, um, advertising, all kinds of stuff. Um, seems really interesting. I've heard it's really funny and obviously uh, very influential. Um, so I look forward to reading that eventually. And lastly, from Borderlands Books, uh, I had to grab this. So this is um, Resume with Monsters by William Browning Spencer. Um, I already owned a copy of this, but it wasn't this edition. This is the edition that I really wanted. So this is a, a horror novel that sort of takes a, a Lovecraftian premise and applies it to um, sort of a office drudgery, um, the office environment. I've often heard it described as a office space meets um, meets uh, Lovecraft, so that just sounds really, really cool and, and funny and interesting. And I wanted this version because, um, well, I like this cover art better, and also it is the Borealis edition which I've mentioned before on here, that was a uh, White Wolf's publishing house, um, you know, famous for Vampire the Masquerade and all that stuff. Um, that was their fiction publishing house, and um, I I love their their look, I love their vibe. Um, I've been trying to collect all of the uh, the Borealis stuff that I can find, and this was this was at uh, Borderlands for three dollars, so I had to grab it. So yeah, there's that. <clears throat> okay, and these are the books that I got from um, from Russian Hill. Uh, didn't get a whole lot because, as I said, um, a lot of the bo the used books were like ten dollars. It was hard to find anything below nine or ten dollars. But um, I found some interesting things. So I found two novels by a writer that I'd never heard of before. Um, so I have a uh, "The Violent Land" by Jorge Amado, and "Tieta" by Jorge Amado. So as I said, um, I'd never heard of this guy before, but um, apparently he's a very um, famous and influential um, Brazilian writer. Um, and uh, these just sounded really weird and interesting, very satirical. Um, I grabbed this one because this seemed to be his most famous work. There are several copies of this, but the one that really interested me was Tieta, which uh, is a melodramatic serial novel in five sensational episodes with a touching epilogue. So it's sort of a, a serial novel, Brazilian comedy. Um, it's about a woman named Tieta who was banished from her island for promiscuity. Um, but then, um, in order to, uh, to save the town from, um, being, uh, having a factory erected and destroying all the beaches, all the beaches and stuff, um, she has to, uh, call upon her close, close connections in Sao Paulo's highest political and financial circles as only the madam of the city's richest, ritziest bordello can. So it's a, it's a madam of a bordello. Um, sort of getting involved in, in politics to, 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 to sort of keep this uh, the, the beaches pristine and stuff. It sounds really satirical, really funny. Um, I've mentioned before, I've been wanting to read more um, uh, Latin American uh, writers and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I've never heard of this guy. If any of you, if you have, I mean, let me know. Um, are these good places to start? I, I, you know, I don't know. Talk to me about it. And uh, this, this this other novel, uh, The Violent Land, I think this one's a little bit more of like a drama, but it's about um, the forests of Bahia, and it's sort of about the people involved in that. Um, it goes into, yeah, uh, the violent, colorful backdrop of Brazil's cacao rush, a phenomenon that rivals California's gold rush in drama, tragedy, and humor. Jorge Amado weaves together the fates of two landowning families involved in a bloody feud over a tract of virgin forest to which neither has a rightful claim. So that's again. That sounds really interesting. Sort of a political environmentalist. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. So um, are these are these good places to start with this author? I've never heard of him before. So those of you who are more experienced in this kind of stuff, let me know. Um, have you read this author? Do you like his stuff? Tell, talk to me. <laughs> then I found uh, this. <clears throat> this is the Movie Goer by Walker Percy. Uh, this is a National Book Award winner that was published in. 1960. Um, this is just one of the many sort of classic uh, mod uh, modern classics that I've heard about. Um, 
I believe this, uh, in addition to winning the National Book Award, it was also listed on um, Time Magazine's like list of like the best novels of like the of 1912 to 2005, I believe. Um, and it sounds interesting. Binks Balling is the moviegoer, a New Orleans man who lives for the bright, fleeting moments of cell celluloid fantasy he experiences at the movies. But real life has a funny habit of butting in, and soon he's more involved than he'd like to be with a beauty who is drifting toward disaster during the Mardi Gras week that will change both their lives. So yeah, I don't know. Set in New Orleans. I love New Orleans as a setting. I love reading about it. Um, a weird guy, you know, wandering, you know, obsessed with movies. Seems like seems to have kind of a similar vibe to. Um, to a, a Confederacy of Dunces, which is one of my favorite books. So I don't know. We'll see. Never read this before, but it was cheap, so I, I'll give. It, I figured I'll give it a try. The the retro um, paperback stuff, the sci-fi paperbacks. Uh, they didn't have a whole lot at at uh, Russian Hill that were affordable, but I did find a few, um, just a couple that looked interesting that were for uh, under five dollars. Um, the first one here is um, Year of the Unicorn. By Andre Norton. <laughs> Dig that cover art. 13 wrote into that other world which only one could master. So I've heard a lot about Andre Norton. I know she was very, very prolific. She wrote tons of novels. I've seen her stuff everywhere. Never read any of her stuff before. Not really even sure where to start. But I just grabbed this because it was uh, cheap and it sounded interesting. So, to pay an unearthly tribute, Thirteen must leave with the Ware Riders. Thirteen, torn from their homeland to ride with illusion and darkness, to travel the unmapped lands with the nomads who are more than men and less than human. That was the price to be paid for an unholy alliance without which the homeland would have been lost, but was the price worth paying. Gillen, who became one of the Thirteen, was to find out, and in the finding, find a lost land, a forgotten world, and a super science challenge. So it sounds really pulpy, really fun. I love the idea of, like, this this group of nomads that are forced into, you know, sort of fighting and stuff like that. Um, the, the stuff about peop, nomads, who are, yeah, nomads who are more than men and less than human, the were riders. Is there werewolf stuff in here? Were creatures? I don't know, but it seems like there's some animal-human hybrids, maybe, possibly. I don't know. Some monster people. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That just sounded fun and interesting. No idea what it's like. I haven't read any Andre Norton before. So, again, if you've read this or if you've read any of uh, Andre Norton's stuff, let me know um, what you enjoyed, where you would start. So, yeah, there you go. And then the uh, the last uh, sort of retro book I got was um, Northwest Smith by C.L. Moore, the legendary hero of the spaceways. So um, this is a, a, a famous... Uh, uh, so this is a famous uh, pulp hero that was... Um, appeared in a bunch of stories by C.L. Moore, who is a very, very famous um, sci-fi fantasy pulp writer. She created uh, Gérald of Jory, which um, Michael K. Vaughn talked about in a recent video. Um, and this was her other sort of most famous character. Um, it's sort of a, a typical um, 1950s, like, uh, space-faring pulp hero kind of thing. Um, but I've heard these stories are really good, really fun, and enter entertaining. Um, and I, I've read a little bit of C.L. Moore. I read her novella, Vintage Season, which was great, and I really liked that. So I've been wanting to read more of her stuff. So I figured, why not? I already have this, and I have uh, Jirelle of Jory, so I should really um, get on to her sometime soon. So, yeah, hopefully that's good. And, again, dig that retro cover art. <laughs> Alien lady with big bazoingas, <laughs> as uh, often happens in these kinds of stories. But uh, So, yeah, hopefully that'll, that's uh, that's interesting. And, uh, yeah, let me know. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so these final three books are uh, ones that came in today from Thrift Books. I wasn't going to talk about them, but they just so happened to come in today when I was going to film this video. So I figured, why not? So firstly, we have um, Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo, uh, translated by Margaret Sayers Pedden. Um, as, uh, as those of you who follow Juan's channel know, um, this is his favorite book of all time, his f absolute all-time favorite novel. Um, I've been wanting to read it for ages. I got it from the library a while ago, but never got around to it before I had to return it. Um, but as I've mentioned earlier, um, I've been wanting to get more into Latin American writers, Mexican and uh, Mexican writers and stuff. Um, and um, Juan Rulfo seems to be one of the most highly respected writers in Mexico. Um, and, of course, Juan vouches for him heavily, so I, I look forward to reading this. And I wanted to read it in English first, so Juan was was amazing, and he bought me um, a Spanish-language edition of Pedro Paramo, which um, I'll go grab real quick just to show you. Yeah, so here's the uh, the Spanish edition, Pedro Paramo. Um, introduction by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So, yeah, I don't know, it's all in Spanish. Um, but I've, as I mentioned, uh, I, or I may have mentioned before, uh, no, I did mention, 
Um, so as I've mentioned before, I've also been teaching myself Spanish. So um, Juan was very kind enough to sort of buy, to buy and send this to me um, as a way to sort of um, serve as like a talisman for me. You know, like this this is this is my goalpost. When I when I can read it in the original language, that's when I'll feel <laughs> decent about my understanding of Spanish. Um, but I wanted to read it in English first, just so I could kind of appreciate the story um, and everything, and hopefully talk to Juan about it. Um, so yeah, so I have both of the, uh, the English and Spanish editions, so I, I really hope to get to this uh, Mexican classic uh, very soon. So, yeah. The second book that I have here is uh, Like People in History by Felice Picano. Um, this is a big, epic uh, gay novel that was published in 1995 um, that I'd heard a lot about and always wanted to read because, I mean, how often... I mean, as it says here from Edmund White, this is the big novel we've all been waiting for, The Gay Gone with the Wind. So it's this big, like... 500 plus page epic about sort of uh sort of the, the history of, of 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 gay men in um the the in the 20th century goes into you know stonewall aids all kinds of stuff just this big sweeping epic gay epic and um i've never read anything like that before but i i've always it sounds really really great just based on that concept so so i bought it and i have read um felice picano is actually a fairly well respected um gay writer um he writes a lot of genre fiction a lot of horror uh, he published a lot of a lot of uh, paperback stuff in the 80s i read um one of his short stories um i can't remember what it was called now but i'll put it up but it was a sci-fi story about uh, a, a a noir detective who um ends up in the body of a man uh, he, he becomes a man and, and he ends up liking being a man more than he ever liked being a woman and that was a really really great story so i've always been wanting to read more of his stuff and this seems like a good place to start. A big, big historical gay epic. Let's do it. <laughs> and finally, <clears throat> another big boy here. This is The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Sorry if I mispronounced that. But um, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, is a, he's an pr assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University and a staff cancer physician at Columbia University Medical Center a former Rhodes Scholar, um, and this is a big epic, as it says, a biography of cancer that he wrote um, and was a winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Um, so it traces um, the history of cancer, of the, of the disease, um, from the earliest historical mentions of it to now, and, some, and talks about you know, some of the things that we've been doing to, to study and to try and um, uh, combat uh, cancer. It just sounded really, really interesting. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about it. Um, I think... Um, Cancer, um, along with sort of a lot of other uh, notorious diseases like AIDS and things like that, is one of those things that um, has has affected the world in, in very profound ways. And um, I'm hoping that this will sort of illustrate uh, some of that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It just seems really interesting. A biography of cancer, you know. <laughs> I, I had to read that. So hopefully this is good. Um, and, yeah, that, uh, that about does it for um, this uh, book haul. This is a really long one, but I hope you guys enjoyed regardless. Um, as always, um, which of these books have you read? Um, which would you recommend? Um, talk to me. I love books. Talk to me. Books. Books, books, books. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll see you guys later, and uh, I hope you enjoyed. This has been Bartell's Bookshelf. See you later. Bye.